Uh, we are in Luke 24 again at the end of the passage there. It's going to be one, one script, verse of scripture from Luke 24. I'm going to read verse 49. Then we're going to skip over to Ephesians 5.18 this morning for our, our message today. Uh, Luke uh, uh, 24. Last week we were in the end of uh, Luke's tw- uh, gospel, chapter 24, looking at the disciples when Jesus had appeared there after his resurrection. And they thought they had saw a ghost. And uh, just like the rest of us would be if we thought we saw a ghost, they were, they were terrified. But then he says this to them in verse 49. He says, Behold, I send or I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. And you need to go and you need to wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued, which means clothed, with power from on high, until power from heaven comes upon you. This is the promise of my Father that I'm sending unto you. Some of the last words that Jesus gives his disciples. Now I want you to turn over with me and look over in Ephesians 5 and verse 18. And the Apostle Paul here giving... Really not not one command, but two separate commands here. One is a don't, and the other is a do command. And this is what Paul says in in, in Ephesians 5, 18, connecting to what Jesus had told him earlier. He says, do not be drunk with wine, which is reckless, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Now, he's talking about the exact same experience that Jesus was talking about when he said, I am going to pray that the gift of the Father that I'm sending unto you, that you will be endued or clothed or baptized with power from on high through the person of the Holy Ghost. And so today we are continuing our series entitled Ghost Stories. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Lord, we thank you for an anointing in this service this morning. Lord, we thank you for your presence that we feel in in this place today. And I thank you for every single person here in the room this morning or those watching either live, online, or, or later on through recording today. God, Lord, touch them and bless them today. God, we bring all of our needs and all of our cares to you this morning, knowing that you care for us and you want to provide for us and meet our needs. But more than that, God, you have a purpose for our lives. God, you want to use us and you want to use this church to make a difference in our community. And God, how can we do that? Father, we are weak and we are broken today, God. And we need your presence and we need your power. And we need need power from on high today in our church and in our lives today to do what you've called us to do. God, grant our prayer today and give us a divine visitation. Give us an anointing today in our church And in lives today that are here in this place this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated today, but just keep your Bibles open here to Luke 24 and and 49. We've been in in a series called called Ghost Stories, Ghost Stories, and I reminisced a little bit last week in the introduction of the message, and I'm going to do that again this week if that's okay. I turned 56 uh, at the end of the, the month of August, and so I'm kind of remembering Back to the 80s, which was kind of uh, my decade, and and what a great decade it was. Not so great for fashion, but but it was a great decade. But I believe we have a slide here of a movie that that came out at the end uh, of the 1980s, which was kind of a, a a fun movie. And and I don't know if we have the the screenshot or not this morning. Uh, but anyway, then there we go. Okay, uh, and and that is uh, I don't know who the actor is. Who's the actor there? Michael Keaton, he's Batman, right? Or he was Batman, but, but in this uh, movie here, he was Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice was a ne'er-do-well, uh, ghosty, a, a, a disembodied uh, spirit that claimed that he would help you, and, and in this case, he would help other ghosts get rid of the living out of the house that they were haunting, I will, but, uh, I guess. But he claimed that, that he would be, be helpful, but he only caused more problems usually than than he solved and in our in our text this morning in Luke chapter 24 there are major major life changing uh horrific problems that are facing the followers of Jesus Christ uh, uh they are in disarray having gone through his arrest and his trial and his execution and now at this present moment in Luke chapter 24 they are being hunted down 
uh, not just by the Romans, the heathen Romans, but really by the religious leaders of their day. And, and now they are being disoriented by rumors that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. And, and they didn't really know what to believe. And some of them were doubting or they were going from believing to doubting. They didn't know whether uh, to be excited or not. And then he appears to them finally and they are terrified because they thought that they had seen a ghost. And so he reassures them that he is not a ghost, although he was dead and he now is alive. And he tells them this. He says, I'm going to give you a promise in the midst of your problems. And I know there's a lot of people here today, me included, that have a lot of problems. If you have problems, don't say praise the Lord, but say amen. The Bible says to give thanks for all things. I guess that means even for your problems. But we all have problems, but we all also have a promise. In fact, we have more than one promise. We have promises. But Jesus said, I know you've got problems, but I want to give you a promise. The promise of my Father is upon you. And if you'll wait in Jerusalem, there you will be clothed or endued with power from on high. And so the, the world that we live in today is full of problems. How many of you know that? All you have to do is watch the news to see that we have all kind of problems in the world. We have problems in our country. Or we have economic problems. We have problems with our border. We have uh, 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 all kind of problems going on in the world and in our country today. And the church is not exempt from from problems. But here's what the message is for the church today is that, that yes, we have problems, but we can choose to focus on God instead of focus on our problems. And not only that, but focus on the promises of God rather than on our problems. And here is the point this morning. We can either let our problems control us or we can take control of our problems. Say, Pastor Todd, that sounds great and I am with you, but how do we take control of our problems? And we do that by focusing not on our problems, but by focusing on the solution. And so I want to give you a, a question this morning as we start out the message today. What would be a real difference maker in your life? What is one thing that could be the, the solution to, if not all of your problems, to most of the big problems in your life? Uh, every day when I drive from my house and I, and I come to the church, I, I pass this big uh, billboard, and I don't know exactly what it says. I don't know if it says Powerball or multiple millions or, or, or the lottery or whatever. But, but this morning, it was still dark, and I'm coming from my house. I actually wasn't coming to the church. I was going to the coffee shop. How many of you go to the coffee shop on Sunday? Well, I was going to the coffee shop to get my fix, and as I'm passing it, the Mega Millions billboard, it was 401. Becky knows. $401 million. I don't know how much that is after taxes. It's a lot. It would be enough. Some people think, boy, if I just had enough money, that would solve all of my problems. Marilyn Monroe had money. She had gifting. She had fame. And none of it was enough for her to want to stay alive on this planet. Money will not solve your problem. Some people think if I had just enough talent or enough ability or maybe uh, if I had the right connections in life, right? It's not who you know. Uh, it's not what you know. It's who you know is what they, they say. If I had the right connections in life, then all my problems would be solved. For other people, it's if my health was right, if I was healthy. Or, or, or if I could get my fitness in order or if my relationships would just be solid and right in my life, then that would solve all of my problems. Well, the disciples had a lot of really big problems, but Jesus said, Behold, I send you the promise of my Father. Wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And he's talking about the person and the presence and the work of God's Holy Spirit. Now, God's Holy Spirit, not just dwelling in you, but being clothed all around you with power from heaven. He is not talking about salvation. How do I know he's not talking about salvation? Because he's talking to believers, and salvation was for unbelievers. 
And the Holy Spirit does do a work in salvation, but the Bible says that in the work of salvation or being born again, the Holy Spirit baptizes uh, that person that's believing in Christ into the body of Christ. And so at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ, and then he indwells your life. This is not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about salvation or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's also not talking about water baptism. Water baptism is for believers, but water baptism is when a, a minister baptizes you into water, symbolizing the baptism that the Holy Spirit has already done in your life, baptizing you into the, the body of Christ. And so Jesus here is talking to believers but in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he's talking again to believers, and he says it the same thing, but he says it a little bit differently. This time he says, you will receive power. Everybody say power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He's talking to believers. And then you will be my witnesses. In other words, you're going to witness for me. You're going to do a work for me. I'm going to use you, but only after you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what Jesus is talking about here is something that I've already mentioned this morning. He's talking about the anointing, the anointing. He's talking about the anointing, and in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, is when we first see Jesus using this word anointing, and he's talking about himself, and he says this in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Now, Jesus is using an Old Testament term here in the Old Testament the Bible says that the Holy Spirit would come upon certain people usually kings or prophets or other type of people of God that he would speak through or use in a special supernatural or a miraculous way and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit would anoint their lives clothe them with power from heaven and these are not perfect people how many of you know that David was not a perfect person I've gone through that before. I won't go through, go through that again. But David was imperfect. Not only that, but David had a lot of problems. David was running for his life from the most powerful man in the country, the king at that time. He found himself in a cave, broke, busted, and disgusted. Uh, and he had a lot of problems. If we look in the New Testament... There are two men, followers of Christ, Paul and Silas, and they had a lot of problems. They were falsely accused, they were beaten, and they were thrown into jail. They were in bondage. And then Jesus himself had a lot of problems. The Roman people were occupying and, per and persecuting uh, his people, the Jews. Uh, the religious leaders were after him and dogging him all the time. His disciples were fussing and fighting among themselves and unbelieving most of the time. And on one occasion, he finds himself with tens of thousands of people who are hungry and without food, and all Jesus has is a little boy's lunch, but that wasn't all he had. He also had the anointing. In fact, all of them had the anointing, and I want to put forth to you today that it was the anointing that made the difference in their lives. David wasn't perfect, and David had problems, and it was the anointing, the Holy Spirit of God clothing him with power from on high that made a difference in his life, in Paul and Silas's life, and in Jesus' life. And here's what you need to know today. There is no substitute for the anointing. There is no substitute for the power and the working and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Popularity is not a substitute for the anointing. You know, I would love to fill this church up not just once, but two or three or four or five or six times over, and I would, would that we had a lot of people coming here. But let me tell you what, that would mean nothing if we didn't have the anointing. All we would be is another big gathering of people in the community or a country club or whatever else. But it, the only way it matters as a church is if we have the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit. Excellence is not a substitute for the anointing. Although I believe that we ought to be excellent. Jesus was excellent. 
We're called to be like Jesus. We ought to be excellent. Somebody say amen today. Whatever we do, we ought to do with excellence. However, we can do everything with excellence and perfectly, and it will not matter a hill of beans in eternity unless we have the anointing power from on high. I am an emotional person. I would, would, would say that I'm probably as emotional as anybody else in here, and I can cry and shout and jump and run uh, uh, with the best of you, and, and that's okay. God made us emotional beings. How many of you believe that? He made me just the way that I am. I'm loud and I'm proud and I cry at the drop of the hat, and that's okay. Everybody say, that's okay. It's okay. And let me tell you what, if it's okay to get excited at the mall or at the ball game or at the rock and roll concert, it's okay to get excited in church. Somebody say amen. amen. Having said that, emotionalism is no substitute for the anointing. I've been in churches before where they have a shout down for hours and hours and hours, but they don't make any difference in their community. Nobody's getting saved. Nobody's lives are getting changed. They're just coming together and having church and having a good time. And emotionalism is no substitute for the anointing. Not only that, but gifting is no substitute for the anointing. The culture that we live in is enamored with gifting, and they don't know the difference between gifting and anointing. And the real problem is not in the culture. The problem is when in the church we can't tell the difference between gifting and anointing. And I'm preaching to myself as much as any man. Boy, if there's somebody that they can sing, I'll tell you what, when I hear Celine Dion sing, sometimes I feel the Holy Ghost. But it's not the Holy Ghost. I'm just feeling feelings. Or, or, or other people singing. And, and sometimes we have people that, that can sing and we say, oh, that's of God. They're, they're anointed. Let's follow that person because they have this gifting or, or they can preach or, or, or talk or, or, or do whatever great gifting that they have. And I thank God because God gives people gifting. How many of you know that God, he gives people gifts? And I thank God the Bible says your gifting will make a way for you. But having said that, in the church, we need to know the difference between gifting and the anointing of God. So Holy Spirit, a gift will stir people up. A gift will entertain a room. A, a gift will fill a crowd. A gift will, will stir people up and get them on their feet. But the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 10 and verse 27, that it is the anointing that breaks the yokes of chains and bondage off of people's lives. And I thank God if someone has a gifting, but let me tell you what, I'd rather have a little bit of anointing and no gifting at all than to have all the gifting in the world and no, and no anointing. And it not just breaks, but its writer says here that the yoke shall be destroyed because of the, the anointing. Again, you can be entertained by gifting, but you need to be changed, and we're changed by the anointing and the power of God's Holy Spirit. Zechariah said in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it's not by might. Nor is it by power, but it is by my spirit. By the anointing, says the Lord of hosts. Now today in the day and time that we live in, God imparts the, oil, the, the anointing not through uh, uh, anointing oil, which is the way that they did it in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they would anoint a king uh, or, or, or a prophet or a priest. Uh, they would take oil, and not like we do today, Today I'll do something like I'll take a little bit of this oil and I may rub it on both of my hands there and, and we do that because the Bible says that, that, to, that the elders, when the sick come forward and that's whether you're sick in spirit or sick in body, that, that they will uh, anoint them with oil and pray their prayer and we'll do a little dab and, and make sure we don't mess their hair up, right, or their weave or their wig or whatever it is that they, they got on there. But, but uh, a, a little dab will do you. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't like that. They would take six quarts. That's a gallon and a half. For those of you who don't know how to do the measurements there. But a gallon and a half. What would happen if someone came down here, Pastor Todd, I want you to pray for me. And I took a gallon and a half of oil and poured over them. They would be the last person that I prayed for that morning, I'm sure, or maybe the rest of the month. But that's how they did it in the Old Testament, but that's, that's not how it's done today. The anointing today is imparted not through oil poured out on your head, but through the person and the work of God's Holy Spirit. 
And it's not just for Old Testament kings and prophets. And today it's not just for pastors or evangelists or praise and worship leaders or super spiritual people. But, but today the anointing of God's Holy Spirit is for every single believer in Christ Jesus. Jesus is no longer with us today in the flesh, but the anointing. Everybody say the anointing. The anointing is still here. And we are his body. We are his hands. We are his voice. We are his feet that go into the world today, that set people free, that breaks the grip of the enemy spiritually off of people's lives, that, that heal people's uh, emotional being and spiritual being, that heals people's bodies today. It is the anointing of God on believers today. You say, Pastor Todd, do you believe that God can use me, just an average believer? I'm not a, a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a worship leader. I'm not even one of those super spiritual uh, uh, people in the church. Can God use me? Absolutely. Not only can God use you, but God wants to use you today. All you have to do is make yourself available to an outpouring of power from heaven on high. Somebody say praise the Lord today. Paul says it like this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, which is reckless, but instead be filled with the Spirit. How many think it's good not to be drunk with wine? I think that's good. He says, don't be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit. That's verse 18. And if you really want to know what Paul is saying, you need to go back one verse earlier to verse 17 where the Apostle Paul says this. He says, do not be foolish. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be foolish. Be wise today. Don't be foolish, Paul says, but I want you to understand what the Lord's will for your life is. Some of you are wondering, what's God's will for my life? Maybe we have some young people in here today that you're wondering, what is God's will for my life? Well, the Apostle Paul, through the unction of the Holy Spirit, is going to tell us right here, what is God's will for every single believer today? Don't be foolish, but know what the Lord's will is. Don't be drunk with wine, which is reckless, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. You want to know what God's will? That's God's will. Number one, don't get drunk. What would happen if our praise team came out here today drunk? First of all, they'd be a lot more entertaining than they are sober, I'm sure. But it would be a horrible situation. What if, what if the preacher came out here drunk today? It won't be me because I only drink when I'm taking communion. And that was only happened to me once that I know of. And we're taking communion today. Hopefully it won't happen today. If it does, somebody's going to get let go. Somebody say amen. No, I'm just teasing. Mistakes happen. But, but don't get drunk. And, and that would be a horrible thing. The preacher is drunk. The, the, the praise team is drunk. God says don't get drunk. That's a command. But instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Say, who should be filled with the Holy Spirit? You should be filled with the Holy Spirit, not just for pastors or evangelists or worship leaders or super spiritual people. It is for every single believer today. This is God's will for your life, and it's not a suggestion. It is a command. I want the musicians to come to the instruments today. The greatest need in your life today is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've heard preachers preach and some people say you get all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get it salvation and that's okay for them to believe that and have that doctrine but that is not the testimony of scripture. The testimony of Scripture is to believers after you have believed, even after you've already been filled with the Spirit, Paul says continue there. Keep going every day. Keep making yourself available and keep on keeping on being filled again and again and again with God's Holy Spirit. That's the greatest need in your life today. But the greatest need in the church and in our church today is to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen if you believe that today. The greatest need of our praise team, our worship department, is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The greatest need for our leaders is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The greatest need for our youth department is to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the greatest need for our church is to have services that are filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost of God from on high. Glory to God. 
The sad truth is that a majority of people in the body of Christ today and churches today have never really received power from on high. We call this series Ghost Stories. And I don't know why, but a lot of people are afraid of the Holy Ghost. Or maybe they're afraid of how they see people acting. And they don't want to become foolish looking or undignified. But again, they'll do it for other things and in other arenas. Talking a lot about Elvis Day. There's an Elvis movie out, and he'd go to concerts, and the young people would get in there and scream and cry, and they would fall out at a young, ignorant guy from Tupelo, Mississippi. But he was Elvis, I guess, right? But we're talking about the God of the universe today that we serve, that we worship, that we honor. And again, I don't believe that we should be out of order. Maybe that's the problem. Sometimes we get out of order. We blame things on the Holy Ghost that aren't the Holy Ghost's fault. Because God is a God of order, not a God of disorder. But let me tell you what, if you're just going to pray, talk to an invisible person, you're going to feel foolish. You may look a little foolish. Especially if you pray in tongues. Say, Pastor Todd, do you believe in praying in tongues? Is that for today? I believe in praying in tongues. I practice praying in tongues. The pastor said, why do you do it? Because I need it. If Peter needed it and Paul needed it, if Mary, the mother of God, needed it, then I need it and you need it today. Pastor Todd, why do we need tongues today? Which is a work of being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, a gift that God gives us, not just to one or two, but, but to everybody. Paul said, I would that you all spoke with other tongues. Why? Because Paul says when we pray in, a, in an unknown tongue, which is a heavenly language, a language of angels, he said our spirit is praying and it builds up our spirit. If it happens in the service and then it is interpreted in the English, then the whole church is built up by that. Not only that, but when somebody speaks in tongues in the church service, Paul said it is a sign to an unbeliever. And I'm not preaching on tongues today. I'm preaching on the power of the Holy Ghost. But that's part of it. Somebody say amen. And if you're going to love God and follow God and look to God, sometimes you're going to look foolish. David looked foolish and undignified, and his wife said, here you are, the king, and you're disrobing yourself, and you're dancing like a madman in front of all of the young people of Israel. What are you doing? He said, you haven't seen nothing yet. I'll become even more undignified than this. And he wasn't out of order. He was in order because he was ushering in the presence of God into the midst of the people of God. And you don't have to act like me, and I don't have to act like you. we got to worship him in spirit and in truth. But sometimes that means looking a little foolish to other people. But people are afraid of the Holy Ghost. And they, they resist things that they don't know and they don't understand. But let me tell you what, it is a good gift from a good father. That's what Jesus says. It's not about becoming a Pentecostal or a Holy Roller or anything. It's just about being a child of God. And God is a good father, and Jesus said, your father wants to give the gift of the Holy Spirit to his children that ask him. I'm going to talk about how you receive the Holy Spirit, and asking is the biggest way. You have not because you ask not. If you want more of God's power, more of God's presence in your life, all you have to do is lift your hands, bow your head. You don't have to do that, but just whatever posture in prayer that you come to God and say, God, here am I. Give me what you got. And you got to receive it by faith. Receive it, receive it by faith. Hallelujah. Christians go around weak, spiritually inferior, and they don't have to. When the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out in the day of Pentecost and they were speaking in other tongues and the crowd was amazed and some of them mocked them and said that they were a bunch of drunk people, but it was 9 o'clock in the morning and they weren't drunk with wine. And Simon Peter explains it to the people there. He said, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. How many believe we're living in the last days? That I will pour out my spirit. Pour out my spirit. Not just on a few spiritual people, but upon all flesh. Upon all flesh. Here's what Jesus is saying. There is unlimited power available to us. Unlimited power. How can I get this power? It's not so much about you getting something as you giving something up. Paul said, present your bodies a 
a living sacrifice. You want the power and the, to be clothed with power from heaven and the person of the Holy Spirit, you got to give up sin. You got to turn away from sin. I'm not saying you got to be sinlessly perfect all the time, but you got to say, you know what, I recognize sin in my life with the Bible. And you say, how do I know what sin is? Whatever the Bible calls sin is sin. Somebody say amen. Whatever the Holy Ghost convict you of is, is sin. Turn away from that sin, first of all, if you want power from heaven, the person of the Holy Spirit to come into your life. First, and then second of all, turn away from distractions. If you want to be filled with something, you got to empty yourself first. Get rid of distractions. And then you need to empty yourself of yourself. Somebody say amen. Some of you just have too much self inside there. Jesus said, if you want to come and be my disciple, you got to deny yourself. And if you want power from heaven, you got to deny yourself. you got to make room. Make room. And then get ready. Was it T.D. Jakes that said get ready? I don't know. Somebody said get ready, get ready, get ready. Say, Pastor Todd, get ready for what? Get ready for a crushing. A crushing? I thought we were talking about power and the presence of God. This only comes through a crushing. If you're just lift, looking to be lifted up and elevated and, and put out in front, and that's what you're looking for, this is the wrong place to come. Jesus said, if you want this thing coming from the Father, you got to be willing to be crushed. The Holy Spirit is likened in the Old Testament and the New Testament to wine. And you don't get that wine unless the grapes are crushed and emptied out. He's also likened to the anointing oil that comes from the olive. And the oil doesn't come from the olive unless the olives are crushed. There's a direct correlation between a crushing in our lives or a willingness for God to crush us and break us down and the anointing that we carry. A power of heaven from on high today. God, here am I. Crush me. Do with me as you will today. God, I empty myself of sin, of distractions. I empty myself of myself today, God. Do a work in my lives today. I want everybody to stand on your feet with me this morning.